optimizing planning domains by accident scheme splitting and your will be giving the talk. Um, do I get a mic or do I have to just stand here? I'm probably going to be moving around a lot. Well, okay. Uh, so I'm going to take the mic over. Okay, let's see. Okay, hello everybody. Um, this is about schema splitting, as you see. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, it's actually fairly straightforward. So consider this beautiful PDDL-like action schema. Okay, as you can all recognize, it's the blocks world. Okay, thank you. Hello? Okay, seems to work. Good. So, what do we mean by splitting? Well, split it, right? So, uh, if you look at this, uh, it seems pretty straightforward, right? So, on the left hand side, you see what we usually call unstack, and on the right hand side, like move two, would be what we call stack. Okay, so that's what splitting is. We're turning a single schema like this into a sequence of sub schemas like this. And of course, the two are supposed to be in synchrony. Why would you want to do that? Well, you know, if your action schema has a lot of parameters, the grounding is going to be huge. It's exponential number of parameters. So here you got a simple um, head calculation example. Um, on the other hand, of course, if I split the same schema up into, say, 100 sub schemas, and I do that to every action schema, the plan is going to be 100 times longer. Chances are the planning heuristic is not going to really like that, and chances are the search space is going to explode. Okay. So we got a trade-off basically of the interface size. So inter by interface, I mean the number of action parameters throughout the talk. So if you get a small interface size, you get a small grounding. If you got many, if you got a small number of sub-schemas, you get a shorter plan. So there's a trade-off between those two. And none of what I just told you is new. Okay. So I've done this uh, way back when we designed the pipes world domain. In the original domain, there were like 10, 12 uh, action parameters, and it was completely impossible to ground this. So we spoon-fed it to the existing implementations by splitting the schema up into smaller parts that they could handle. Okay, same, exactly the same thing was done by Body et al. in the cybersecurity domain, and exactly the same thing was done by Patrick Haslam in his online genome edit distance domain. So all of this has been done. Uh, I guess I could just stop here, right? Save us some time. Why don't I stop? Well, okay, so that's all. We have to deal with this word automatic. Good. Automatic means you have to systematize well, how can we actually split an action schema. And you might think, well, it's really simple. I'm going to split the uh, move from X to Y with uh, unstack and stack. Actually, it's not that simple. And even in the blocks world, it doesn't work the way you think it should. So let's consider the split again. Um, first off, I mean, so this is at PDDL level, right? What you have to imagine is that in your PDDL, you have this, and then you make a PDDL domain file prime which contains this, and this here goes away completely. So, first off, if you do this to all action schemas, you have to make sure that those sub-schemas you're talking of are actually executed on block and in the sequence you like. So you basically have to add flags to the PDDL, you know, the usual PDL hacking, forcing the planner to use those things in the way intended. That's the easy part. Um, I presume you don't see the hard part. Does anybody see a problem with this split? Uh, I'd be surprised if you would because we didn't for a long time. Do you see a problem? Which predicates you put in which? Yes, yeah, so you have to decide how to do it. Okay, but let's say the decision has been taken for us. The org told us to do it that way. There still is an issue here. You need to make sure they go, go together in the same order. Yeah, okay, that's the simple issue I already put on. So there is an issue that is more subtle. I don't expect you to see it and I hope you don't see it because we didn't see it for like half a year. Okay. So what actually happens is that you have to take care of the special case that some of those parameters get to, to be instantiated with the same object. Okay. So in this case here, this literal unifies with that literal, right? Clear Y, clear Z, you instantiate Y and Z with the same object. They are the same ground fact. And then the split schema ends up adding its own precondition, right? So the, pre so the add effect comes before the precondition. In at least one ground action, they are the same. So in the split domain at PDDL level, this split domain actually allows the planner to move x from y to y, which is something you couldn't do in the original domain. Now, I'm not sure if this actually causes trouble in this particular version of the blocks world. Of course, in general, it you know, breaks um, the equivalence you want to have. So we need to take care of that. How do we do that? Well, what I just explained is essentially an ordering constraint. Okay? Uh, it's an ordering constraint over what I call annotated atoms. 
They're really just the first order atoms that appear in your action schemer, annotated with where they occur. Like this means in the precondition, in the add, in the delete. And then if two literals are unifiable, means they're the same in at least one ground action, you have to order the precondition before the add, the precondition before the delete, and the delete before the add. Okay, the understanding is that if the add comes first, you might add your own precondition, that's what we've seen. If the delete comes before the precondition, you might delete your own precondition, and then you're not able to do something you could have done in the original task. And this delete before add is because it gives a preference to add. So if the same ground fact is added and deleted, we say it's true after the action. You could do this vice versa, whichever way you want. But what you get is a graph over annotated atoms. Okay. Now, if you look at our previous split, the problem is that, well, here in our schedule, in our sequence, this guy comes before that guy, whereas according to our order relation, it shouldn't be when vice versa. Okay. The precondition should have come before the add. So you might think, OK, so this doesn't work. Why don't I just invert the ordering of my two subschemas? Okay, I could just say, OK, now let this be number one and this be number two. Uh, it might be kind of unintuitive, because then you would stack before unstacking. So it doesn't work right in the head. So the computer could still be OK. However, in this case here, it does not work. Why? Well, let's step to a representation where we can see exactly what works and what doesn't work. That's what I call the quotient graph. Um, I mean, it's not a very uh, unique name. I mean, essentially, I'm just viewing the action schema as a set of annotated atoms, like here. Okay. And then each subschema as a subset of those atoms. You can uniquely identify your split as a partitioning over those annotated atoms, right? And then you can view this partitioning as a block graph, a quotient graph over this graph here. Okay. So showing you this. In our example, this is what we get. Okay, the green guy here is the first action subschema, everything involving X and Y. The, black, the blue guy is the second one, everything involving Z. Okay. So what is the issue here? Maybe you can see it now. I'm not sure. Now it should be very clear. Okay. Look at the red edges. We got an ordering relation from green to blue. Green has to come before blue. And also from blue to green. Blue has to come before green. It's cyclic. doesn't work. So I just call an, uh, we call a split valid if and only if the quotient graph is as cyclic, and that's the case if and only if there is a sound sequentialization of the split. Okay. So the, the as cyclic quotient graph splits are exactly those that you can do. And uh, just to come back to my example and show you that actually it really isn't that intuitive, even in the blocks world. So here we got our cyclic block graph. How do we fix it? Well, if you look at this uh, annotated atom here, all edges from blue to green go into this guy, right? There's no, no, none of the other literals is involved in an edge that goes this direction. So I think, okay, let's break the cycle by separating this node out from the green block. Okay. So we introduce the third block. Now you get orderings from green to blue, from green to red, and from blue to red. As cyclic works. And the final split you actually have to do looks like this. Okay. So I trust none of you would have come up with this split first off in the blocks world, right? And neither did we, like I said. So I mean, there are some subtleties here. But this is really sort of like the most subtle part in how to arrange the splits. The rest is relatively easy. By decorating splots, if you remember, we have to you know, put this PDDL hacks to make sure it behaves as intended. Um, ends up looking like this after the decoration. OK, so decoration is not a word I came up with. That's uh, Carlos Arestes. He's from Logix. And apparently, there they use this kind of terminology. So I don't find it very decorative. but. Um, just very briefly, it's not that interesting really. Uh, this precondition here says that, OK, you're currently not processing any other block. You delete it in the first action. You re-add it in the last action. And these um, do things here, they just fix the sequencing. And you have to do that okay, to make sure all the ordering constraints are satisfied. And then this here is perhaps a little more subtle. If you have the same variable appearing at the start of your sequence and, and at the end of it, you need to make sure they both use the same object for instantiating it. Okay, you have to ensure consistency of parameter instantiation across the sequence. OK, and this here is really just a complicated way of saying it works. Okay, so um, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the plans. Good. So I'm not going to go into detail on the formulation of the claim. Um, so essentially, now we know how to split, right? We know how to turn the PDDL into the equivalent PDDL with smaller subschemers. 
And the question, of course, is what is a good split? Okay, so now we're getting back to the question we posed at the beginning. So how do I decide how to split those schemas? Uh, it ends up being a search space uh, across a lattice of possible splits. Okay, at the top we got the trivial split, which is just the original domain. Okay, so that's minimal in terms of split size, in terms of the number of subschemas, just one, but maximal in terms of the interface size. And at the bottom, we got what we call the atom split, and there, you know, you just take this um, this graph. Let's look at this one here. You know, and for each of those annotated atoms, you create a separate subschema. So each subschema gets to, you know, care about exactly one of those atoms. And it doesn't get any, the interface doesn't get any smaller than this, of course. Um, this here is just the formalization of the trade off I mentioned at the outset. Okay, so split size is the number of subschemas you're generating, interface size is the maximum interface that you still have, and there's a trade off between the two. If you want to be optimal, the trade off turns out to be NP complete. Okay, so we're just facing sort of like uh, the usual optimization problem here. And we solve it mixing the usual ingredients. Uh, essentially, we want to have a trade off between the two features. So first, we need to normalize them so we can compare them in a weighted sum. Okay, if that's what we want to be using and that's what we did use for the moment. So this is just normalizing split and interface size against the respective maximum possible. And then somebody like the user gives us this parameter gamma, which tells us, you know, where you want the trade off. Do you want a small a uh, split size or you want a small interface size. And then this here will be finally our optimization function. Okay, so this is what you want to minimize. If you set gamma to one, then you'll be stuck to the trivial split. You're not willing to do any schema splitting at all. If you set it to zero, it means I'm gonna split as long as I still have room for splitting. And then you solve it with the usual stuff. And that brings me to the experiments. Okay, I think I might be too fast, I don't know. Okay, so what is our experiment setup? We use fast downward, we have a canonical solver as you see here, and then lama to represent the state of the art. And it's only about runtime for the moment. We didn't look at anything else. And yes, uh, if you want to get accepted at like ICAF, um, you know, you're doomed to use this stuff. Um, the problem in our context, of course, is it doesn't make any sense at all. Okay. I mean, like I told you, I mean, I went there myself in 2004 and spoon-fed the domain to the planner. So if somebody has already done this, okay, we're done. I mean, our job has already been completed. I mean, our job is to work on the domain file to make it digestible. If, if a human designer has already done that, there's nothing left for us to do. In other words, the grounded encodings of almost all IPC domains are just too small for this to pay off. Okay. So uh, what do you do in this situation? You're trying to submit to ICAPS. Well, you need to get some different benchmarks. And uh, here's what we did. So there's not a huge benchmark set for this out there, really. I mean, we're looking at the modeling benchmark. This is not really about solving an a priori. This is about modeling. And um, so you need incompleted models. And in order to get those, we basically just look at the original domains before they were manually split. Okay, so in the pipes world, what we actually did, we took the IPC domain and unsplit it back to the original domain, which I had deleted in the meantime. And uh, Haslam actually thankfully left the original domain in his collection as well. So that was still online. So what we got in those situations is we got the original domain, the manual split domain, and our automatically split domains. And we're comparing between the performance of those. And if you're missing those two domains here in the list, uh, yes, I missed them too. Uh, dearly, the problem is that they're ADL and our current implementation doesn't handle that. Good. Uh, we ran this experiment systematically. It turns out that at least in this formulation of the op optimization problem, beam search doesn't actually do anything interesting. So we just report on hill climbing. And also these different gamma values usually didn't make that much of a difference. Okay, here's the first table. This is just about the split statistics. So like what happens to the domain file. If you look at, for example, here, the original domain has maximum interface size 12, <coughs> which is really absolutely ungroundable, right? And uh, manual split goes down to seven, and then here with our first, even with gamma 0 0.8, which is close to one, it gets down to six. And then, you know, all the way down to the atom split, the interface size decreases to three, but at the price of like increasing the number, she must to 93 from four. Okay, so you really don't want to be using the atom split. I mean, this is just crazy. But uh, if you set gamma to zero, uh, what happens is that probably you get the same maximum interface size. I mean, so. The only thing that happens is it puts together those atoms that have the same interface anyway. And, uh, well, you get a much smaller domain size. So this here is, could be reasonable. This here really is unreasonable. 
Um, good. Uh, I put those IPC domains here just for comparison. You can ignore them. Okay, anything else? I don't think so. Good. So our results on the IPC domains are real bad, to say that up front. Um, what's going on is, well, just what you, what you would expect, okay? The grounding size goes down, the search space size goes up, just exactly like we would have expected. Problem is that B much more than A, okay? So as far as A goes, if you sum it all up across all the IPC benchmarks, you get 4 million ground actions, and after the split, you get like 2.5. But uh, if you look at this, well, okay? So below the diagonal is bad. Um, okay, so on the IPC, it really doesn't do anything, and that's also what you would have expected. So here's what you get on the, uh, on the more interesting domains for all purposes. And so first, if you just look at blue and red, um, blue means better than original, red means best. So essentially, if you're comparing it to the, to the manual split, wherever it's um, red, it means it's at least as good or even better. In this case here, it's actually marked better. Coverage is 66 for automatic split. 52 for the manual split. Uh, so Patrick talked to me about that. He was a bit annoyed. And um, so I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't have an explanation. I don't know why this happens. It might be just a, a hiccup of search. I don't know. Um, in any case, so basically the message is that much of the time the automatic splitting gets up to the performance level of manual splitting or close to that. Uh, the, this transport case here, where there's a small runtime advantage, is like 700 seconds gained across the board against the baseline. It's like the only case I found in the whole IPC where it actually got faster. So this is really like a, a complete outlier. Um, okay, uh, if you, you know, just for verification, this here is the advantage in millions over ground actions compared to the original domain. So the groundings do get dramatically smaller, as you would expect. Okay, and um, that's already the end. So uh, I think this could be useful too for non-experts. We've been talking quite a bit at this conference about you know, making our stuff accessible to outsiders, people who don't know what the hiccups are of the existing implementations. And I think this could definitely be a useful tool for them. I definitely would like to have this in ADL because the more interesting domains are usually formulated in ADL. And one thing I'm not sure if you noticed that's really stupid in what we do currently is we have this optimization function, okay? We just look at the, oops, it's on here. We just look at, I mean, this really just looks at the syntax of the PDDL and then says, oh, well, this might be good, this might be bad. There's absolutely no reason in the world for doing it that way. You could just take a set of training instances and optimize the performance on those training instances, right? So you get a form of domain-specific learning where you optimize the domain, your PDDL, against the performance in a set of training instances. And from that perspective, there is much more. This is really a pretty wide area. I mean, you, there's lots of stuff you can do, just automatic model reformulation. You do some model transformation step, you validate against training data, you get a new domain, and as we all know, modeling may have a huge impact. And there's lots of ideas you got in this area, and I'd be happy if anybody would be interested to actually join us there. And that's it. Thanks. Yeah, so I was wondering whether you do the automation at the paddle level or at the SAS level, because what I would expect to find if you did it at the paddle level is you would get a totally different number of SAS variables once you grounded it? Uh, yeah, but we didn't look, I mean, we do it at the PDDL level. Yeah. All right. So that, that's what the whole idea is about. You don't look into the planner at all. It's completely planner right. independent. Because what I do is I change the objects and end up having to automatically split the domain operators. And what that does is totally change the number of, of SAS variables and, and grounding. Did you look I mean, at whether your no, SAS I mean, variables we, we, changed? We are completely at PDDL level. I mean, of course, the, the FDR okay, encodings so the that FD derives are completely different depending on what we do here. We didn't look into this at all. OK. It might be interesting to look at. I mean, it, so like, more like generally, it would be interesting to connect this to the grounding. There is some information you get in the splitting process that would be quite useful to have in the grounding, but at the moment we can have it because our only interface is PDDL. So if you allow a richer interface there, there would be more stuff you can do. Um, I think <coughs> this. Um, since, you were to manual, thank you. since you were referring to manual splits as being like the ultimate goal, and um, I mean, I'm not from the community, but it seems to me that uh, when, you, when the models get very big, uh, the, automatic, um, the automatic methods will work better because humans cannot actually comprehend the whole uh, set of alternatives. Um, 
thanks for saying it. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, possibly. I, I can't really tell. I mean, if you got a really complex domain, it might not be obvious how to split it for the human, I guess is what you're saying. And that might be true. I mean, I'm just using them in the way I'm doing it now because this was the only sensible way of benchmarking this at the moment. I'm not saying this is like the, like, yeah, you know, it just, it's just, it's just what you can do based on what we have. No, it's it not like you the said other. that the, uh, the experts can be annoyed by having better solutions. Oh, uh, I, I see. I, I expect that to happen uh, more than. Yeah, I mean, so the thing is, in the pipes world, the automatic split does look quite a bit more awkward than the than the one I did by hand. That's because, like, if you know what the domain is, there's certain you don't have to do all this flagging, like all this decoration that I did here. Uh, it's really like complicated, and you know, if you know the domain, you know certain properties of it. Some of this can go away. So, I mean, the the, the manual split has the advantage of somebody actually knowing the domain and having the freedom to, you know, leave out stuff that's not needed in that particular domain. So that's why I kind of think it'd be great if you can even match the manual domain. But yeah, I mean, you're right, and in some cases it actually worked better. Patrick was annoyed, that's why I just reported it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I like uh, that you came to that slide. So uh, this particular split is pretty bad for a five heuristic, right? For, to my, uh, uh, for literal session, right? Well, um, let me go back to... This slide then, um, yes. <laughs> so all of them are, I mean, they, they don't get, as usual, they don't get the flags, and then what's going on in the heuristic is like crazy. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're ending up, you know, using a piece of this action from here and another piece of that action from there, and it all gets meddled up. So uh, it's definitely dangerous to the search, very dangerous. It really only pays off if your original domain was huge, and you have to be careful about how much you split. Yeah, but you could, uh, I don't know, reformulate it somehow that would be, like, this will not work with the red black right? Uh, I guess so. I mean, it's, it's, it can be confusing for any abstraction, but really, I, I don't believe you can prove me wrong that there is a way of doing this that would be easier on search heuristics. Maybe there is. I don't presume there is. It's really just, you know, a technique for getting from an impossible domain to one that is possible. Okay. Uh, we have to... Okay. Um, can we have Mark, maybe? He's been raising a sentence. We're out of time. Okay. Okay, let's thank Jorg again.